Thanks everybody for joining today. My name is Andrew Shikiar. I lead marketing here at, at FIDO Alliance. Uh, amongst FIDO's most critical programs is our certification offering. Uh, I like to say uh, that specifications without certification is like one hand clapping. Um, certification is what provides the marketplace with confidence that products will adhere to the specifications and also that they'll interoperate with each other. Uh, this certification, this interoperability is really what underpins uh, the FIDO ecosystem today and has also facilitated development of hundreds of FIDO certified solutions. Uh, we've recently expanded upon uh, our traditional functional testing to include two new initiatives which you'll hear about shortly. One for certified authenticator levels and another which we announced last week being a, a biometric certification testing regimen. All in all, now's a great time for your company to either take part in FIDO certification programs or to specify FIDO certified offerings for your implementations. As you'll see in our agenda, we'll cover all these topics on today's webinar as presented by our guest speakers. So we'll go through the overall value of the program, talk about the authenticator certification program, the new biometric program, uh, which also has some interdependencies with the authenticator certification levels. And then last but not least, uh, talk about how you get started with certification, then answer any questions and, and answer at the end. So we're joined by some expert speakers today who represent some of FIDO's you know, largest contributors to our certification efforts, including Brett McDowell, our executive director, David Rivera from Lenovo, um, who also chairs our, our certification working group, uh, Dr. Stephanie Shuckers uh, from Clarkson University, who's led our biomet biometric certification efforts, and Dr. Hay Rayward, my colleague, who's a certification director here at FIDO Alliance. Before we get started, uh, just a few housekeeping items. Um, first, yes, this will be recorded and the slides and replay will be shared with you afterwards. Uh, secondly, uh, feel free to ask short questions through the GoToWebinar client. So as you've logged in, you'll see um, a dialog box with a little carrot next to it for questions. You can ask questions there. I will try to answer them midstream if possible and otherwise we'll take them in Q&A at, at, at the end. Uh, note that all attendees are in listen-only mode, and we will you know, basically narrate your questions at the end uh, if selected. I will do our very best to answer all the questions. If we don't get through all of them, uh, we'll follow up with you um, as best possible. Uh, last but not least, uh, there's a survey at the end of the webinar. Please take a few moments to fill this out. Uh, your feedback is really instructive for how we shape this program moving forward, so we, we greatly appreciate you taking just a couple minutes to complete that survey. So with that, I'm now very pleased to start things off with Brett McDowell, FIDO's Executive Director. Brett. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you all for attending today's webinar and those of you who are hearing the recording after the fact. Um, I wanted to just do a brief highlight of the program uh, and then turn it over to our experts to take you through the details of the program. So basically, I want to cover why we have a certification program in the first place. So we are a trade association. Our mission is to supplant the world's dependency on passwords, uh, introducing simpler, stronger cryptographic authentication standards so that someday every device um, that connects to the internet will have this capability and every application will take advantage of that capability. So obviously interoperability is critical and we want to test for that, but also not at the expense of conformance. So our program ensures that the specification continues to be the letter of the law of what FIDO authentication is. So the conformance uh, the test cases are written and the test suites are provided uh, for people to self uh, assess their conformance. And then um, that plus interoperability ensures that our implementations will work in the real world and that everything that is called FIDO really is FIDO. So there's a trademark protection program that goes along with certification, um, and that's to protect the integrity of this new ecosystem. Um, in addition, over, over the period of the past few years, as the FIDO ecosystem has matured, we have uh, closed other gaps in sort of the trust of the FIDO ecosystem. So for example, when we started the program, uh, we were only looking for conformance and interoperability. Now, all the client-side authenticators, right, everything that happens client-side, 
that device that's in the possession of the user, you know, whether that's a standalone authenticator or, or an embedded authenticator or a software authenticator uh, running on a device. Um, all of the, those devices have a job of protecting the FIDO credential. So FIDO, again, we are supplanting the shared secrets model for authentication credentials. We use asymmetric public key cryptography. So the real secret in the FIDO ecosystem is the private key generated by your device, by your authenticator. And so we want to measure how well authenticators are protecting that private key from attacks. And so you're gonna to learn today more about the levels that we have, uh, pretty granular system to address all the use cases that our members have raised. And we've added that security testing of the authenticator's ability to protect their private key. And we also then expanded that to include other user verification data. So uh, not only are, do we have this strong proof of possession of a private key authentication system, uh, we also uh, have the capability to test uh, not only for presence, but to validate that it's the same user that's present. So we have user verification capabilities on many of the authenticators. Sometimes that's a biometric, sometimes that's a PIN number or even a local password. What's important is that is always local and on device. So the data associated with user verification is also in scope for what we test uh, the authenticator's ability to protect from uh, remote attack. And then you'll find out that even at the highest levels of authentication uh, assurance, uh, we have, we're looking for defenses against physical attack. So we uh, have a full range of whatever the use cases are, you know, whether it's, um, you know, kind of popular uh, website traffic to regulated financial services, healthcare, to, you know, uh, top secret uh, government use cases. We really have the security spectrum covered uh, in the different security levels of authenticator certification. And then I did already mention biometrics. So over time, we heard that it was important that we start to help the relying parties, those uh, businesses that are rolling out services that will rely upon the effectiveness of these FIDO authenticators, to add the ability to kind of vet how well does that biometric perform. Um, entropy on a PIN number and password is well understood, but we discovered together as an alliance that there really wasn't a fit for purpose certification program covering biometric performance, just the performance of the biometric component itself. Um, and so uh, that's, that's what we're, we're also now introducing. And that's the kind of the big news that you might have seen recently announced. And that we're happy to have this webinar to you know, add more detail to that announcement. So I thought I'd also mention, you know, sort of how, how where are we in our journey with the certification program? Who has been uh, taking advantage of it? Uh, what's the value been of all the certifications already delivered in the marketplace. So now most of the implementations that here you see about 475 uh, certified implementations so far, most of those are functional only. They're the conformance and interoperability. So when you see FIDO, you know it's gonna work with you know, the other side of that protocol handshake also with a FIDO logo on it. Um, so now that we've added security, we're starting to see a, a bigger uh, percentage of the certified implementations on, on the client side, taking advantage of the security testing. And of course, biometrics is brand new. Um, but these are some of the companies, just to give you a sense of the quality and breadth of uh, solutions and products, uh, both on the client side and the server side. So you have some leading uh, OEMs, from both the mobile phone and PC market, that have certified products in market, and they they have had certified products for some time. We have the the dedicated uh, portable authenticator marketplace. Uh, that's probably the best known because people actually go searching for these products by using keywords like FIDO certified, FIDO U2F, FIDO2. So the security keys here, and of course the solutions. This is one thing I wanted to mention here for all of the relying parties that are learning about the program. 
when you go to our website and you start looking for, you know, kind of uh, down uh, sample the what's available on the market to the vendors that you want to work with, you want to send your RFP to, um, you want to just look at the server certified solutions. Uh, because that's what you're gonna to need to FIDO enable your infrastructure on the cloud side. So you can just kind of, we, we have a uh, searchable database tool. So look for the servers and that's gonna give you the subset of, of so it's gonna go from hundreds down to roughly a dozen uh, that you wanna look at. And here are some of the, the leading brands in the space. And last, I just want to tease a little bit more about where we are now and what is coming down the pike and what is coming on the rest of this webinar. So briefly, um, FIDO2 is the new technical specification set that we've recently approved. Uh, that's a partnership. Uh, we produce the client to authenticator protocol uh, at the FIDO Alliance, but we submitted our work on the JavaScript API for the web browsers over to W3C. Uh, which is the ideal place for formal standardization of uh, web browser APIs. And they, uh, they have also moved uh, the FIDO2, which is known as WebAuthn, uh, the, the browser component of FIDO2, to uh, recommendation. So we have the standards that are now out there, uh, fit for commercial use uh, at the implementer's draft uh, stage of standardization. And we just last month, had our very first uh, formal certification event and I'm looking forward to announcing uh, the FIDO2, the very first set of FIDO2 certified uh, products and uh, infrastructure solutions um, in the coming weeks. We've also um, rolled out new uh, security authenticator assessments at the highest levels. So our program runs all the way up to what we call three plus. So now for the very first time, we've introduced the ability for authenticators to certify themselves at the various, very highest level of authenticator assurance, you know, with defenses against um, attacks on those private keys, you know, even when the attacker has physical possession of the user's device. And the, of course, the biometrics program, which covers not only uh, false accept rate, but we want to make sure that these biometrics perform in the real world. So it also covers the false reject rate. And most importantly, and probably the greatest value to relying parties as well as biometric vendors, is the introduction of formal presentation attack detection, looking for spoof attacks and helping the marketplace get better at detecting and defending against those spoof attacks. So those are just some of the things that I wanted to highlight and summarize for you. And I'd like to turn it over to David Rivera, our chairperson over certification, and he can tell you much more about the program. David. Thank you very much, Brett. And thank you everyone for joining the webinar. Um, I'm David Rivera, uh, director of software and device security uh, at Lenovo. And as Brett said, I've been chair of the FIDO certification working group uh, for since its inception about five years ago or so. Uh, it's been very exciting over these years to see all the changes going into the certification program uh, as we grow to uh, enable additional capabilities for uh, authenticator vendors and server vendors and, and relying parties. So I'm excited to talk about uh, some of the changes that we're, uh, we're going over today. So Brett touched upon the fundamental purpose of the certification program. Um, there's a couple of parts to it. One is verifying that your authenticator implementation uh, meets all the functional requirements. So does it uh, implement the specs correctly? And then does it interop uh, with other implementations? Um, in addition to that, we have the uh, security certification as well, which uh, Brett touched upon. We'll go into a little bit more detail here. Uh, which provides more information about your uh, authenticator um, that can be useful to um, users and, and reliant parties. Uh, once you've completed the certification process, uh, it, give, it then gives you the right to use the um, FIDO certified logo on your products. Now, one, one thing I'll, I'll make clear here is what we're talking about today is authenticator certification. 
Uh, it is possible to certify other components of the FIDO ecosystem, uh, including FIDO servers. Uh, FIDO server certification program is a little bit different. Uh, it, it focuses on the functionality and, and interoperability. Uh, it does not have the security level certifications that we're talking about here today. So everything we're talking about today is focused on uh, authenticator certification. So what we are looking at here are the different levels uh, available for certification. As I mentioned earlier, the prerequisite to all, to all this is that your implementation meets all the functional requirements so that you've uh, run the conformance tools to verify that your authenticator um, implements the specs correctly. And then you're uh, also participating in some interoperability testing to make sure that your implementation works uh, with various server implementations. Uh, and then what you do is decide which uh, security level uh, you want to apply for. Uh, at level one, we're showing the very basic baseline security level. Um, this is really intended to be able to cover almost any kind of uh, authenticator, um, be it implemented in hardware or in software. Um, and essentially, this basically is a level that says this implementation has some basic protections around it, and ultimately, uh, it's better than uh, using passwords. Um, this slide and some of the ones after it will talk about level one plus and also level two plus. Um, those those two programs are actually still in development. Um, so we, we've included all, all of it here just to give you an idea of, of where the levels lie. Um, but we're gonna focus more on level one, level two, and three and three plus today. Uh, level two, we start adding some protection um, for the device. Um, so if you're running, for example, your authenticator in a uh, trusted execution environment, um, that would be for level two. And then at level three and level three plus, we're covering uh, physical attacks to the device. Um, this slide, you can see some examples of what might be uh, certified at each of the levels. Uh, I won't cover every single example on this page, but as you can see at level one, um, you could be uh, just a, a software-based authenticator. It runs in an app. Um, it could be uh, an authenticator that runs on Android and makes use of the underlying Android uh, key store capability. So there's, there's quite a bit of flexibility there in level one. Again, the key thing with level one is um, you know, you're, you're providing an implementation that is better than uh, the passwords we rely on today. At level two, um, an example there is uh, uh, an application running in some trusted execution environment. Um, I'll, I'll talk about how you actually uh, would apply for and, and, and have these certified at the different levels here in a minute. Um, but uh, if, if your trusted execution environment, for example, is not certified by any external uh, certification body, you might apply for a level two certification. And then a level three and level three plus, again, we're adding more um, physical device protection to your authenticator. Um, you potentially have or plan to have your um, implementation certified by say common criteria. Uh, at the highest levels. So now you're protecting against your you know, physical attacks to your board or to the, to the chip in your authenticator. Now, again, what these levels provide you is, um, is what these levels provide is more information for relying parties. As Brett mentioned earlier, um, a, uh, a financial institution, for example, may set restrictions on, uh, on transaction limits based on the security level of the authenticator that's being used. Um, or a large enterprise might choose to only allow their users to use something at level three, for example. Um, other implementations might be satisfied that as long as it's better than passwords, um, it's acceptable. So anything level one or above is, um, is acceptable. So here we see how you can, um, what's, what's involved in uh, applying for uh, each of the security levels. Uh, with level one, it's essentially a review of your implementation. It's some documentation that is provided to FIDO and the FIDO uh, security secretariat will review that information. Um, there's also some basic um, uh, verification of your implementation that's done by the secretariat, um, just ensuring that uh, you know there's no obvious um, 
security uh, issues with the device, but nothing in depth. Again, it's primarily reviewing documentation and doing some very basic validation. Once you get to level two, um, all, all of the, uh, the security certifications do require uh, that you as the vendor uh, work with a, an external testing lab. Um, that testing lab will have been approved for doing the security certifications by FIDO. Uh, at level two, that lab is essentially doing uh, a more in-depth security design review of your implementation. Again, primarily design documentation, um, working back and forth with you as the vendor to, to understand more about your implementation and, and doing that level two an analysis. Um, at level three, again, we're using a FIDO approved testing lab. Uh, but they're going to do a little bit more in-depth testing of your implementation. So that might include actual uh, penetration testing of your device, code reviews, um, uh, again, detailed review of your implementation. So, so it'll be a little bit more in-depth. Um, obviously, that, that uh, goes hand in hand with the higher levels of security that you're applying for. Um, so at level three and three plus, we are introducing this certification companion program. And the basic idea here is if your authenticator has already achieved certification or you're planning to go to certification for some other um, external certification, uh, for example, common criteria, um, this, this allows you to achieve your FIDO security certification a little bit easier. So you can map the um, requirements for what you're doing with common criteria to the FIDO requirements. So when you submit for FIDO level three, three plus certification, um, it, it's, it's much simpler because you've already uh, essentially done most of the validation that's needed for common criteria. There may be just some deltas that have to be validated um, for, for FIDO specific requirements. So it's basically a simpler way for authenticators um, that may have already achieved uh, common criteria or the ISO 15408 certification to uh, achieve FIDO level three or three plus certification. Now we also understand that in the real world, um, you know, once you ship a product, you, you know, may need to make updates to it in the future. Um, there are a couple of different programs that are available to support that. Um, one is Delta certification. So if you do need to update your product um, for uh, you know, fixes, new versions, um, addressing some um, published security vulnerabilities, uh, any, any sort of change to your authenticator um, that doesn't fundamentally change the behavior or the security characteristics of that authenticator can go through this Delta certification program. Uh, so it's it's a much simpler way um, to have your changes certified than having to go through the full certification. Again, uh, you basically just document the changes. Uh, the FIDO security secretariat can determine what the impact of those changes are to the security of your authenticator, and then. Um, you can you can either uh, get a simpler Delta certification, which may not require you to go back to the lab, or if it's a more extensive change, it may, it may require a, a retest with the lab. And uh, the other option we have is derivative certification. Um, this is essentially uh, certification for pro for new versions of your authenticator that have not had any changes, right? So perhaps uh, year to year. Uh, you release a new phone model, for example, but your authenticator that you're using within that phone is exactly the same. There's been no changes to it, um, but it's a new model of a phone or, or USB authenticator. Um, in that case, if, if nothing at all has changed with it, it's essentially a, a paperwork certification. You're just indicating that nothing has changed. Um, you file the paperwork with the FIDO Alliance and that new product can get derivative certification. So there'll be a little bit more information about the overall process and what you need to do for certification uh, a little bit later. Um, so this was just covering essentially the new uh, the, the security levels, what they mean, and introducing some of the new security levels. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Stephanie Shuckers. Hi. Um, 
Happy to be today. I am leading the biometrics group that developed the biometrics certification program, which I'm going to describe in the next slides. Thanks for having me. So the biometric certification program is uh, designed such that a biometric component can be tested. So this is typically something that would happen prior to integration into a FIDO authenticator which as uh, was described at the beginning, a FIDO authenticator could be software, it could be a mobile device, it could be a laptop, it could be um, a USB key, et cetera. So um, the reason why we are focusing on the component um, rather than when it's fully integrated is that uh, it gives time to do the biometric testing. As I'll describe the requirements in the next slide, you'll see that it will take some time. It's not that we couldn't, um, uh, uh, assess it while it's integrated into Authenticator. We certainly can, and the program's open to that. It's it's just we thought that made more sense. So you'll see more as we go over the, the next slides. So from a biometric vendor point of view, you would develop the biometric subcomponent and then submit it to a FIDO accredited laboratory that would do the testing. And I will describe the requirements for that testing in further slides. But I want to point out here that since it's at a component prior to being integrated into, um, an, into a mobile device or, or some other form, uh, we also ask the vendors to provide an allowed integration testing document. This document describes uh, the different changes that might result um, from the integration process. And therefore, it would allow a conversation between the vendor and the laboratory to test multiple uh, possibilities of, um, of, of the biometric subcomponent such that we cover the range of the possibilities once it's integrated. Then this allowed integration testing document goes along with the biometric um, component certification. And if the integration stays within that range, then it would be considered certified. If the integration goes outside that range, obviously you would need to recertify. Next slide. So that allowed integration document describes the possible changes in software and hardware and actually may require the vendor to give multiple versions to be tested that cover that range. Um, and so as long as that range is covered in the testing, then all possible different integrations could would be certified. Once the component, uh, the biometric component is certified, you know, the rest of the process is just like it's been described before. There's a functional certification, and then there's a security um, evaluation, which could go to a, which would go to a FIDO accredited security lab, which could be the same lab as with the biometric or maybe a different lab. And then uh, as part of that, uh, there's a self-attestation stage, which includes some self-attestations associated with biometrics, which we'll talk about in a minute, and then uh, they get a FIDO authenticator certificate as well as able to use the FIDO certified logo. So if a biometric is certified, um, it could be used at any of the levels, uh, one through three plus. However, it's only required for levels three and higher and once L2 plus is created, it will also be required for L2+. Plus. But it's optional for levels one and two. So it that information would be included in the metadata to show that it has this optional certification. So how do we evaluate the biometric system? As was described earlier, we're using the false accept rate. That's the probability two different people match when they shouldn't. You know, we think of this as a security measure, as well as the false reject rate. So the probability you're rejected when you shouldn't be. This is more of a convenience measure. We also measure uh, the imposter attack presentation match rate. What that is, is when someone creates a fake biometric, an attacker, and tries to match um, the enrolled person. They are attacking the biometric at the time of presentation of the biometric. That's where that presentation comes from. So the requirements are that the false accept rate 
should be less than one in 10,000 at an 80% confidence level, and the false reject rate should be three in 100. So how do we assess that? When the, the vendor submits the system to the laboratory, the laboratory will perform live subject testing. So they'll bring um, actual people, many people, into the laboratory and do a combination of both online and offline testing to assess the biometric, to, to assess the false accept rate and the false reject rate. That assessment is based on standards, ISO standards, uh, 19795. In addition, uh, the laboratory will create fake biometrics or presentation attacks um, and present those to the submitted system. And then the imposter metric I presented in the last slide uh, will be assessed. Um, and so we will look at that imposter attack presentation match rate for each type of attack that's presented to the system and ensure it meets our requirements. In addition to the live subject testing, we allow the vendor to self attest at lower false accept rates. The reason why we don't test for those lower false accept rates is uh, because of cost and time it would take to bring those subjects through to achieve those levels. However, the vendor may have uh, test data that supports those lower levels and the biometric um, accredited laboratory will check the test data as well as um, compare it to the live subject testing. And if they support each other, then they would be allowed to self-attest at lower false accept rates. Of course, the false accept rate needs to be in an associate, associated false reject rate, which needs to be less than 3%. And now I'll introduce Dr. Ray Hayward, who will talk about uh, getting started with your certification. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you everyone for joining us today. So I will go through the processes for getting certified through each of the different programs that have been discussed today. And to start, I wanna share with you the different roles that are responsible for the success of both of these programs. First, we have our working groups. We have our security requirements working group, and those uh, individuals are responsible to define the requirements for the authenticator certification program and act as our FIDO security experts. The other working group is our certification working group. This group is responsible for the implementation and management of the FIDO certification programs. And it also contains the subgroup of biometrics, which Stephanie is the chair for that group, and that defines the requirements for the authenticators or for the biometric program, and they act as the biometric experts. We also have what we call our secretariats. We have a certification secretariat that is responsible for the implementation, operation, and management of the, the uh, all the certification programs, and we have a security and a biometric secretariat. They're responsible for reviewing the applications, going over the questionnaires, monitoring the program, and they act as the independent experts for both of those programs. We also have a security re review team. This team is responsible for researching and responding to identified security vulnerabilities. We have the tr certification troubleshooting team, and they are responsible for the diagnosis, dispatch, and resolution of any program and operational issues. Our accredited laboratories are the testing labs that have gone through a rigorous testing uh, training program, and they are accredited to conduct the test for both the authenticator and the biometric program. We also have our various vendors, and these are the parties that are seeking the FIDO certification for their products. Our partner programs or companion programs are the independent certification programs that FIDO has an official relationship with. And some of the examples are for our current level three and three plus, which is common criteria. Lastly, are our OEMs. These are the original equipment manufacturers or the companies whose goods are used as components in the products of another company, which then sell and finish the items to users.
Both authenticator and biometric certification programs have similar processes, but the starting point for each is very different, so we'll address them separately. Since functional testing is a prerequisite to authenticator certification, that is the starting point for this process. When a vendor is ready, the first step is to register for, the, for access to the self-conformance test tools. You can do this by submitting your request through the following link that's provided in the slide deck. All UAF authenticators will also need to register for a vendor ID, and they will be required to conduct automated and manual testing. We recommend that you complete and pass our conformance testing at least two weeks prior to attending an interop event. This will help ensure success during the actual event. Additionally, a vendor can elect to participate in pre-testing to increase their successfulness in the, honor, in the interoperability event. The last step outside of attending the interrupt event is to register for the event by following the registration links. Our goal is for each event to have the registration up at least 60 days prior to the event date. With that being said, the next functional interop event will be in South Korea from the 12th to the 15th of November of this year, and will we be opening registration soon. The existing process for interop testing is a live event that is scheduled approximately every 90 days, which was mentioned on the slide before. The goal for a vendor is to plan accordingly based on their product schedules. In addition to the live interop events, we'll be looking to expand our on-demand testing capabilities. We are currently offering on-demand testing for U2F, but we'll expand to offer UAF and FIDO2. In order to achieve successful interoperability at these on-demand events, there is a need to fully develop the reference implementations that will be used for testing. The goal to, is to expand the reference implementation library and be able to offer more on-demand testing across all three protocol families. Under this program, there will be a calendar with dates to select, to select from and follow the required processes based on the protocol family that you are certifying against. This might include virtual testing, ship testing, or in-person testing. We look forward to expanding our on-demand interoperability testing as a matter of convenience for our vendors. Continuing on with the authenticator certification process, an implementation must have successfully completed FIDO functional certification requirements, including the before mentioned conformance, self-validation, and interoperability testing. This must be completed before applying for the authenticator certification and selecting a security level of your choice as described by David earlier. The level selected will determine the evaluation process, whether internally with the FIDO Security Secretariat or with an externally accredited FIDO lab. Regardless of the level selected, all authenticators are required to submit a completed vendor questionnaire to which the evaluation process will be completed through corresponding test procedures. The final step of the security evaluation step is a submission of a FIDO evaluation report to the Security Secretariat who will review and issue the final results. After passing functional and authenticator certification, the vendor will be ready to apply for their certificate and be able to use the official FIDO certified logos. The vendor is also encouraged to execute a trademark licensing agreement and submit their metadata to the FIDO metadata service, which has been mentioned before, an important, is an important aspect for relying parties in determining what products are FIDO certified to what level and what other characteristics they uh, include within their, their product. Now we can turn our focus on how to certify a biometric component. The initial process is basically the same as the authenticator certification program. The first step is to request an account and apply for certification. Once the application is approved, the vendor will need to select and negotiate with an accredited biometric lab for the evaluation portion of the testing.
When the vendor and lab are ready to move forward, the lab will conduct all the biometric testing per the policy based on the, the biometric requirements. When the lab is complete with the testing, the lab will produce what we call our FIDO biometric evaluation report and submit to the biometric secretariat. This individual will review and issue the evaluation results. Upon passing, the lab evaluation, the biometric vendor can request certification to be processed and issued. At this stage, it is possible for the biometric component to be integrated into an authenticator per the integration document requirements mentioned earlier, and then continue through the authenticator certification process. This was a basic overview of how to get certified with FIDO, either through the authenticator certification or biometric component. Thank you, and I will hand it back over to Andrew. Great, thanks so much, everybody. Um, so as mentioned at the beginning of the session, now we're gonna to turn to Q&A. Uh, before we get into Q&A, I do wanna remind everybody that yes, we will be sending uh, a link to the replay along with the, a link to the slides uh, following the webinar, uh, probably the next 24 to 48 hours. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and jump into Q&A. Um, what I'd ask is that you ask your questions, type your questions in the, the, uh, the software client, the GoToWebinar software client, and we'll get to them uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, we tend to get more questions than we can answer, so if we don't get to your question, um, please feel free to send an email to info at fidoalliance.org, and, and we'll get back to you. Um, otherwise, we'll you know, try to answer them directly as well. So uh, the first question uh, we have here, I'm going to send to to Stephanie. Um, with respect to real world operation of FAR, FAR, FRR for biometrics, would there be any specification for testing conditions? Uh, so do we control for noise conditions and things like that? Hi, um, this is Stephanie. So we do not assess um, varying conditions. Uh, the reason we have developed the biometric certification program is to really focus on the security parameters. So even though we do measure the false reject rate, uh, we are not focusing on that. And obviously the false reject rate can be impacted by things like a noisy environment, um, light pollution, uh, dirty hands, et cetera, et cetera. And so, because those are more on the user experience side, that's not what we're focusing on for this test. And, and part of the reasoning is, is we presume that you want your customers to be satisfied uh, with your experience in the biometric. And so the vendor is motivated to achieve that in and of itself. And Stephanie, this is Brett. If I could just add, one of the things to keep in mind with this program is not only is it the first of its kind for this portion of the marketplace, but we have every intention of iterating this program. So remember, the developers of this program are the companies in the marketplace. It's the relying parties who, who are putting trust and faith into these authenticators, as well as the developers, the vendors, the supply side of the marketplace. So we're going to learn and evolve uh, and iterate relatively quickly. And that's part of our strategy over the next several years. So for example, if relying parties really start having a problem, a performance problem with you know, uh, a non-trivial number of biometric uh, authenticators in the market, they may say, hey, we need to do something more around you know, testing for environmental factors. So I just wanna give a character of you know, how we're governing this program and tweaking it over time. That, that's a great point, Brett, thank you. Um, <clears throat> sticking with Stephanie, uh, a question about uh, confidence level. So can you explain uh, what you mean by 80% uh, confidence level? Yes, we use um, the ISO standard document 19795 in terms of the statistical analysis of the results that we achieve. Because the laboratory does live subject testing, uh, they have data you know, the raw data, which they can do statistical tests on. And so this, the particular statistical test is bootstrapping and is described in ISO 19795 part one and in our requirements document too. Okay. 
A related question. Uh, one in 10,000 has a FAR, FAR, false attack rate seems low, and one thinks about high-risk transactions. How can a relying party exploit FIDO if their fear demands a higher FAR, FAR? So, Brett, do you want to address this? Sure. Yeah, the, the, a few, the, general question on thresholds. So, um, this I, I want to say a few things about kind of where this question is coming from. Um, even earlier in the presentation, when David was presenting the different levels uh, of assurance that we have for the authenticators, um, what I want to keep in mind is just because we are providing this data about you know, these authenticators are more secure than those authenticators. There really isn't an expectation in the market that lower level authenticators are going to be rejected. The expectation is more around how you're going to score by policy, you know, by the policy engine you have in your risk-based authentication backend. How are you going to score those sessions? So it might be the case that um, some relying parties that are looking for strong authentication are going to perhaps require a second challenge on top of the FIDO authenticator if it's at the very bottom of the assurance range. But for the most part, we're talking about an ecosystem full of passwords and maybe some one-time passcodes and all the authenticators defeat that in terms of uh, the ability to, you know, be uh, the, the, by eliminating the vulnerabilities that are so often exploited in both password and one-time passcode two-factor authentication engines. So keep that in mind. And so now back to the one in 10,000 question specifically, uh, there is, we think we have identified the sweet spot between cost of taking a solution through certification and value to the market of having performed that assessment. Um, so it isn't that these authenticators are only uh, one in 10,000 from a false accept rate, it's that we are, you know, only, if you will, testing for one in 10,000 with, uh, you know, live people coming through and being sampled uh, in situ certification by a lab, third party, explicit third party validation, which is new to this marketplace. Um, all of the false accept rates that you see are done in a different way, more kind of self attestations, uh, uh, self-assertions of what that biometric can do. And I'm not saying that those self-assertions in any way have been false. I'm just saying that they've gone about uh, coming up with those numbers differently than we are. So that one in 10,000 done in this way is actually quite valuable to the relying parties in the marketplace. And in addition, as Stephanie pointed out, you can self-attest uh, to your, you know, one in 100,000, one in 300,000, one in a million, whatever you think your authenticator can do, you just have to supply the valid test criteria that you performed against your own authenticator to add that kind of as an addendum to your certification. Okay. Thank you, Brett. Let's shift to some questions around the uh, certified authenticator levels. So, so David, a, a general question on the companion program. Um, I'm not sure if it came through clearly in the slides. You know, is the companion program mandatory uh, to use uh, for a vendor, and at, at what levels is that mandatory? So engagement so, of third-party vendors. Yeah, so the companion program is really intended as a way to help certification of uh, FIDO, for FIDO to be uh, easier, because there's really an expectation that, um, you know, at, at that level, you, you're, it's most likely that your authenticator already has um, so, something like common criteria certification, right? So if you got, a, say, a Java card implementation of a FIDO authenticator, um, you likely already have at that security level some common criteria, uh, and basically the companion program helps make it easier um, since, since many of the security requirements are going to line up with what was needed to get that common criteria certification. So it's not... Uh, strictly mandatory, um, but the, uh, the basic thinking behind it was, um, you know, you've, you've likely already have uh, certification at those, uh, at those, you've already gone through an extensive certification at that level, and, and the, sort of the uh, companion program will make it easier to sort of ride on top of that to, to get it. Um, otherwise, uh, yes, so, so all the security requirements at that level could be 
uh, handled by a security testing lab, um, but it will be very similar or comparable to what's being done for, uh, say, common criteria. Okay. So actually, a very related to question, very related question to that. Uh, what if the USB token design uses a secure element which is not yet common criteria certified, but is undergoing testing? Would it still be eligible for level three plus? So a test in progress. Uh, Ray, I don't know if you have any specific input on that. I think the answer is basically you can still get three and three plus. Um, I think, again, it would be easier to do once you've achieved common criteria or depending on the lab you're using to actually do it in, in parallel to have that same testing lab also certify for, for FIDO3, uh, FIDO level three. Yes, David. So the re the requirement would that it, it would need to have this, the common criteria certified um, as part of the, the base for that in order to achieve the level three certificate level three plus certification. So uh, if it you're currently seek, looking to seek level three plus, uh, you can do them in parallel. But the caveat is, as I was going through my slides, that the authenticator would still need to pass the functional certification, um, which would be the com conformance test tools and the interoperability event testing, which in essence, there is a possibility that if it does not pass, things would have to be modified and therefore um, possibly you know, affect the certification, but it is possible. Um, it would just have to be negotiated with the lab that's accredited by FIDO to go through the process that way. Okay, uh, Ray, some other questions for you, some kind of nuts and bolts questions. Um, two of them here, uh, is, there, is there a requirement to renew certification every X years? And then a separate question, um, when will on-demand certification for UIF authenticators uh, be available? So I will tackle that one first. And um, pretty much the on-demand certification is um, predicated on our, us receiving uh, reference implementations to test for the interoperability. And we are currently trying to expand that program and get those reference implementations in reaching out to all prior certified products to see if they would be willing to donate in order for that to be achieved. So I don't quite have a date at this point in time, but we are actively working to get this program up and running and it will be announced as soon as it's available. Okay. So the other question was with regard to whether or not certifications expire or have to be renewed every so many years. And the answer is no, the certifications do not expire. But there also is a caveat with that, especially as we are introducing um, uh, authenticator levels in that every authenticator uh, starting in November that goes through the certification process will be required to select a level that is available in the process. And there's the potential, and it's all outlined within our authenticator certification policy document, that if a vulnerability is identified or there are other potential issues that can occur um, as the program um, matures where the authenticator could actually come out of scope and a notification would be sent to that um, vendor and there's an entire process on how to um, go through what I would say like a Delta certification in order to make sure that this, if the changes are minor or major and at that point in time in the juncture, we would determine whether it's an addendum to the certification or through a whole new certification. So there are potential uh, options that could cause a certificate to have to be reevaluated. Okay. Thank you, Ray. Sticking with you. Um, how many labs uh, for biometric testing are we planning on certifying? And where do we stand today? So we currently have uh, one accredited biometric lab, 
but there are two others in the pipeline that are being reviewed by a biometric uh, secretariat. And as we've been accrediting our, our authenticator or the security labs, we have, several of them have shown interest. So I imagine we would probably have a good handful across uh, the US, uh, the Amer um, Europe, and in Asia as well. So I don't know exactly how many, but it would be uh, um, options across the globe. Okay. Um, a, a lab related question for Stephanie. Uh, will it be possible to debug sessions with the biometric lab to know where we stand with current hardware software version versus IM, IPMR, for instance? We have no concept of that in the, the requirements documents, um, but what the labs can do is, and are required to do actually, is to submit the attacks that will be mounted against your system to the vendor. So you will have knowledge of what attacks will be tested um, during the certification prior to going into certification. And they should give you a reasonable time um, to prepare for those attacks. Okay. And Stephanie, um, do we cover all native authenticators? Um, so fingerprint, iris, touch ID, and if not, which do we not cover? Yes, we do. Um, so we have uh, written up for face, finger, iris, voice. Uh, it's most particular to the attacks. Um, obviously, assessing false accept rate and false reject rate um, is general to any type of biometric. But we also leave it open if a novel biometric uh, modality um, is to be certified, um, that the testing regime is open to it, and there's some procedures to determine the attacks for that novel modality. Okay. So, Brett, coming back to you on that thread we had before um, on how the uh, relying parties can look at layering security solutions based on these scores, it, what are some solutions a relying party with a serious risk aversion might use based on these certifications? Sure, so I'll give you, a, I'd, Please don't take this as advice. Fido Alliance has not produced a best practices paper on this, at least not yet. We might, um, but I'll give an illustration. So um, if you are a US government agency, then uh, you, you may be required to comply with a particular um, authenticator assurance level under NIST Special Publication 800-63-3. Um, let's say that you are obligated to meet level two, you know, multi-factor authentication. Actually, this the it's easier if you say three. So you're required to meet level three of that framework. Um, therefore, you might conclude that a given FIDO authenticator that isn't uh, certified, so we haven't necessarily done these explicit mappings, so I'm, I'm loath to even give a number of, of what our authenticator level should be to the NIST 863 level, because those are explicit mappings that can be done, uh, I would say should be done and will be done, but they're not done yet. Uh, but let's just say it's uh, uh, maybe two plus, right? So two plus is you're using a TEE, so, um, you've got proof of possession of a private key, and it's, it's undergone a third party uh, evaluation, you know, pen testing by a lab. So let's say you're only going to accept a FIDO authenticator as compliant with your assurance level three if it's two plus, three, or three plus. And, uh, and therefore, if you're presented with a level two authenticator, then you may need to do what you're already doing. And so maybe you're uh, sending an OTP on top of uh, a password or on top of uh, a smart card or something. So you, whatever the layer you already have, you might have to continue to use that layer to supplement the authenticators that don't meet your criteria for, you know, single gesture, best of all worlds user experience. I think that is, an, it, that ex sort of illustrates the point of building in, using the FIDO metadata service, which has the certification status of authenticators in it, to feed your risk-based authentication engine 
and take appropriate decisions in terms of when to do uh, step of authentication and when not to. Okay. Great, we have one last question. We're a little bit over, I just want to answer this last question. Um, so Ray, uh, if a device has multiple functions, we update the firmware with changes to other functions of the device, and there's no changes to the FIDO part, does one still need to do Delta certification testing? So uh, the typical answer I would say here is if there's no changes to the FIDO, um, functionality then that would be no but we do actually have a process in place and it's called the FIDO impact analysis report where the vendor themselves will do an assessment on their product and identify what those changes are it'll be submitted to the security secretariat it will be reviewed and then it a uh, path would be determined whether it's a um, you know for the Delta so it could be a minor if it's a minor change or if it's, if it's no change, then it could be considered just a derivative. If it's a minor change, then it would be an addendum to the certi certification. And if it's a major change, then it would be a full recertification. Okay, very good. So that's all we have time for today. We're, we're over time. Um, if there's any, there were a couple of added questions we'll, we'll respond to as, as we can offline. Or if any of you have other questions, please send an email to help at fidoalliance.org. Um, as a reminder, please do take a moment uh, to fill out the survey that you'll see as you exit the session, and you will receive a follow-up email uh, in the next day or so uh, with a link to the replay and the slides themselves. So thank you all to our speakers, and thank you all for joining today. I will look forward to seeing you on a future FIDO webinar. Thank you. <laughs>